Hi again, I'm Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This afternoon, we are in conversation with Timnet Gebru, founder and executive director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, DAIR. Timnet, welcome to RightsCon. Timnet, I can't hear you in my ear, so let's make sure the technical team has got that or it's not on your end. Oh, that's me. It's my problem. Ah, there I was we muted. go. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, before Good, we get how are you? <laughs> Before we get going, let's do some housekeeping. Um, I want to remind everyone to post your questions online. Uh, even if you're in the audience, you do uh, want to post it online um, through the app. It's on the back of your uh, name card. There's a, there's a little QR code and you use this uh, program called Slido. There was a technical issue in the last In Conversation where I encouraged everyone to post questions and we couldn't see it. So we've resolved that and I promise I will get to your questions. I know a lot of people want to talk to Timnit uh, today. A little bit more about Timnit before we get going. Um, before her current position, she was at Google before being fired in December 2020 for raising issues of discrimination in the workplace. She had been co-lead of the ethical AI research team and she received her PhD from Stanford. She studied algorithmic bias and the ethical implications of artificial intelligence. Timnit co-founded Black in AI, a nonprofit that works to increase the presence, inclusion, visibility, and health of black people in the field of AI and is on the board of Addis Coder, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching algorithms and computer programming to Ethiopian high school students for free. A lot of amazing things that you have done and are doing. I guess I want to start by asking if you could just introduce your organization to us um, for those who are not familiar. Uh, my organization is called DARE, um, the Distributed AI Research Institute. Um, and it's a, you know, distributed currently across three continents, uh, the EU, North America, and Africa. Um, and our goal is to do two things, to uh, both kind of mitigate the harms of current AI systems and um, kind of ring the alarm where we see issues, but also not just get stuck doing that. <laughs> and kind of put forward our affirmative vision for the future of how this technology should be built in cases where we decide that it should be built. Um, and our organization has um, not just researchers, but also labor organizers and activists as well um, working on, it, on this vision. Now, your institute states that, quote, AI is not inevitable, its harms are preventable, and when its production and deployment include diverse perspectives and deliberate processes, it can be beneficial. Talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I just, um, I don't believe in techno-solutionism. I just, I don't believe that, um, you know, it's just like this hammer that will solve everything like many of the tech companies are talking about right now. Um, but I do believe that um, if we if we start from the needs of people, um, we can assess whether there are technological tools um, that we can build that you know help specific people under specific conditions. And so that's what we mean by this, right? We don't believe that we're marching to a predetermined inevitable march uh, of a technological future, which is often how AI is talked about, um, we want to remind people that we have agency as human beings and we decide what to build and what not to build. And if we want to build something useful, we have to, we have to start with the needs of people um, and create you know, tools that help specific people. Are you finding your message being received well by governments and other uh, people in the tech sector? Well, I currently I'm battling the existential risk people, which is ridiculous because um, our message, uh, you know, I want to focus on actually mitigating harms of current AI systems and, you know, I kind of imagining a different technological future. But what's happening currently is that the tech billionaires, um, the same people who are building and profiting from AI systems also have a wing 
that is talking about the fact that, that, that according to them, that AI poses a threat to human extension like every single human. And um, which, which is like this sci-fi Terminator scenario that they've come up with to basically distract us from what actually is happening right now, what people are doing, what corporations are doing, what governments are doing. You know, we just heard the visa issues in Costa Rica, right? People are using AI systems to discriminate against many groups of people in the world. Corporations are using it to uh, centralize power and profit from stolen data. And, and instead of speaking about those issues, we're now having this imagined scenario about, you know, human extinction from Terminator and all of these multilateral organizations and all of these governments are falling for it and um, listening to this tech CEOs that should be regulated rather than setting the tone for what we should be regulating. So what I think I'm hearing from you is that um, there are these catastrophic warnings um, that is overwhelming the message of things that need to be done perhaps incrementally, things that are happening, as you say, present as opposed to future. And it's very convenient if you talk about things in the future because then you can just talk about things in the abstract. And there's actually harm being done right now. Is that, is that, is that a good takeaway? Yes, it's extremely convenient, not only because we're talking about things far into the future, but we're talking about what some machine god would do rather than what humans and entities are doing. So it helps them abdicate responsibility. Instead of thinking about opening our deep mind or Google or Microsoft or governments or militaries, you're now thinking about some hypothetical Terminator thing and what that thing would do. And you're thinking, let's regulate that rather than the humans and entities who should be regulated or held accountable in some way. So Looking at the present day issues as opposed to the future concerns and worries, if we're looking at the present day, it also looks like, generally speaking, governments around the world are failing, failing at, at the proper guardrails. What's your take? Where do you see, let's just, I want to focus a little bit on positives, not just negatives as well, and it sounds like that's <laughs> yeah. what you want to do too. Where, do you, where are you encouraged? Where are some good examples in countries um, and, and, um, and others where you're concerned? I mean, just a little bit of both. So um, in terms of um, positives, well, I just want to say it's a nuanced conversation, right? Because when we talk about regulation, regulation can also be weaponized, right? We've seen regulation on um, hate speech and uh, social media reg weaponized against dissidents and activists. So um, I kind of want to make sure we're being nuanced when we talk about regulation. Um, but um, honestly, the most um, inspiring things I've seen are from smaller organizations, smaller cities. So for instance, in the US, I mean, the federal government is a mess with respect to regulation. But you know, certain cities, so for instance, California, even the states um, can set the tone because many of the tech uh, companies with worldwide um, influence are there. And many of the tech companies are also based on Washington state. So if you pass something in, in one state like California, that could have really far reaching consequences, not just in the US, but all over the world, right? Because they have to abide by these rules and it's easier to pass something statewide than you know uh, nationally. Uh, and even think about internationally, that like, the UN, that's even more of a, um, kind of, I don't know, I feel like uh, it's, it's hard to do that. So I, I look for, I look at those kinds of um, instances. I think that there are some wins in the EU AI Act right now, but, um, but then again, with one hand, EU is regulating certain things. With another hand, they are funding Frontex and the Libyan government and, and killing so many of our people, right, the um, refugees and immigrants. So um, I'm sorry, I, I need to stay on the positives, but right, you know, right. some positives it, are, it's okay. yeah, if efforts. I, I feel like so far the conversation is not entirely doomsday. Um, I am already getting some <laughs> questions posted online, so I'm going to ask one of them. And by the way, those in the audience, if you're having trouble listening, the headphones do have volume buttons on them. Just want to remind you of that. Uh, there's a question from someone um, asking, since you were talking about regulation, in your view, what is the what are the main risks of generative AI in the absence of regulation? 
Well, um, so I, I wrote a paper about uh, this partly, which is partly why I got fired. Um, and in this paper, we discussed a number of things. One is um, we didn't. We talked about specifically the text to text space, like um, Chat GPT and and similar ones. Um, one is the environmental impacts, um, and so these systems require a lot of um, compute power. And so when you're um, using them, I mean, to train and to, to in, for inference time, right? So. Um, you know, this is not happening out in the cloud somewhere. It's happening in data centers that require water, that require energy. Um, and we talk about um, environmental racism, right? Not within countries and across countries, right? And when you look at the kinds of languages and people that are um, served by these systems um, and the people who actually um, pay the environmental catastrophe, they're completely separate people. One group of people benefits, one group of people um, pays for the climate catastrophe, right? And um, it's also caused the equivalent of what my um, collaborator calls an oil spill in our information ecosystem. And now you can generate um, so much content as gory as possible, as um, extremist as possible, whatever it is. Um, and just like you know, any kind of oil spill, this environment, this kind of information, um, oil spill, let's call it, is cleaned up again by people in marginalized communities, right? So I, I believe Richard is um, is there. He told me um, he's there, but he was one of the workers who was moderating um, OpenAI's output, the models of um, the outputs of OpenAI in Kenya. And he was talking about, we had an event where he was talking about how he had PTSD and so many other people like him had PTSD moderating the outputs of these generative models. And it was worse than moderating the outputs of human generated content, right? So this, this, this kind of explosion of synthetic media and what it would do to our information ecosystem is another one. And then the, the, the third one I think about is worker exploitation and data theft, right? Just like human to human communication, human to human, um, you know, creativity and agency, what's happening to artists who are just trying to survive already in, in, a, in a world that is very, that doesn't reward creative work and um, massive amounts of stolen data are being used for these systems for companies to centralize power. Imagine mm -hmm. if it actually, was the way OpenAI said it would be. What they want is for you to, for everybody around the world to use their one model to do everything, right? They want you to not go to the doctor, use ChatGPT for that, not go to send your kids to school, use ChatGPT, not communicate with different people for art, use one of their models. Is that a world we want to live in? I don't think it is. Great. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. I, I, I mean, I've just started going into questions far earlier than I planned, but uh, if people are enthusiastic and also a lot of comments. I'm also checking online. There's a comment from uh, somebody. It says, it seems like the issue with existential alarm is, alarmism is a red herring uh, for the current uh, harms that result from the asymmetrical power structures that capitalism has constructed. All right. So, in terms of questions, we have another one asking, can existing generative AI models, which cost millions of dollars to train, be cleaned of, quote, unethical content, uh, for example, copyrighted, uh, or must they be retrained from scratch? Thoughts, Timnit? Um, I really think that they should be retrained from scratch. Um, I think that um, if you have... So first of all, many of the, the current models, um, I mean, not the open source ones, but the ones by like people like OpenAI, right? You don't have access to the actual model to retrain it or do anything. You just have access to whatever they provide, the output of whatever they provide. So um, I think that if you started in an unethical way, you gotta start the whole process from scratch and do opt in that a lot of people are asking for opt in rather than opt out data collection. So I have to opt in to be for this data to be collected. Um, and, um, and, you know, compensate people. Like if I write a book and you want to make a movie out of my book, you don't just take my book and do that, right? You um, compensate me. We have, a, we have a, a discussion. We come into an agreement. 
So, uh, you know, that's really what I, what I think needs to happen. And if you look at, you know, I work with, for instance, we work on, um, I work with a number of startups that are working on language tech for yes. a number of African um, languages. And they're not using these humongous models because, you know, they, they are doing some really task specific, context specific uh, models. And so they're hiring a lot of people from the countries where the language speakers come from. That's another issue, right? Why should people from around the world give their data to one com company located in one country so that that group of people profits? What about the people, the language speakers from around the world? How about, are they getting hired? Are they getting the, the benefits of the, you know, model training, et cetera? So, you know, to me, if, if you don't, um, if your goal is not to like take over everything, I don't really think you need such big um, models. Yeah, it's a big problem in terms of languages, which I'm sure a lot of people um, are aware and have been impacted by. I mean, I, I speak a uh, uh, Cantonese and and even Google Translate doesn't really accommodate that very well. Although you know tens of millions of people speak this language, um, and now there's an, another moment where many languages around the world could be left behind uh, with uh, this AI co uh, collection in terms of not being included. Um, let me just go to a few other questions. Let's see. Um, one, these are anonymous questions, people are shy. Do you think regulating AI is the way to rebalance power asymmetry and harms between big tech and consumers, or is it more foundational, like antitrust approaches? I think both, you know, a lot of the issues we see with AI, the, the existential risk people want to make it look like it's like some new, you know, I don't know, thing, but a lot of them are old issues dressed up in a new technology, right? Um, centralization of power uh, by rich countries versus poor countries, that's not a new issue. Colonization is not a new issue. Um, military powers, you know, arms race, that's not a new issue. Um, so I, I think a worker exploitation is not a new issue. So I think depending on, um, I do think that in many countries, it, the existing laws that they have could actually do have jurisdiction um, to cover some of these um, issues because they are about companies and government agencies, not necessarily about the tech. But um, but I think that um, specific regulation, for instance, um, if you even did something like require people to document their data and make sure that it's opt-in consent, for instance, that is already huge in my opinion because then that doesn't allow you to just ingest everything on the internet um I mean, you, you know without you listening though i mean you, you talked about like um starting from scratch or, or earlier it, you can say that but is it is it wishful thinking at this point it feels like sometimes the trains already left the station how do you stop See, I, this is exactly <laughs> where i say it's not inevitable right i just i think that we do decide what to do if we decide this is not where we want to go the companies will fight it. They'll make you think that they can't do anything. They, they'll make you, you know, car companies were fighting regulation forever, right? Um, and, and so it's like you just, if, if you decide that there are certain um, characteristics that these models need to have to be out, to be out in the world, they, they, will, they will have to abide by those characteristics. That whole research ecosystem moved in this direction in my opinion because it, it we, we literally learned how to steal data and 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 work with stolen data without compensating people and we learned how to exploit workers right if we weren't allowed to do that the research process would have changed to accommodate that like every other industry is much much slower i used to work in hardware before you can't move this fast in hardware because there are so many guardrails that you have to put out so i think i don't think it's inevitable and i don't think it's too late when we talk about, i mean this is transnational i mean it, it, it crosses borders and then i wonder about like yes civil society can get a seat at the table it's a hard battle sometimes but they can in the eu or, or the united states but but like say china uh which i mentioned earlier in another in conversation uh how do you even convince them to have a conversation when they're pretty closed door about uh 
these so, things. So, you know, this is why I, mean, I don't know about these multilateral, you know, I mean, being from Ethiopian air and being of Eritrean descent, I just, I have to say that I, I don't have a very um, hopeful view of the UN or any of those kinds of organizations. Um, but I think that what people have to understand is that there is this arms race narrative, like a person, a good guy with a gun, a bad guy with a gun kind of thing. And at least in the US, a big portion of the reason for not regulating is because, oh my God, if we don't do it, China's going to win, you know? I've heard that. And, and it's, I just don't believe in that. Half of it is made up. The other half is just because somebody else is doing something bad to their own people, you shouldn't be also doing something bad, right? Like, I don't really believe in that kind of argument. Got it. Well, we have um, another question coming in. This one has been upvoted. When thinking about fears about AI, are you more worried about the technology side or the humans behind it? Uh, I kind of feel like this question has a philosophical assumption here, but um, why don't you take a stab? The humans. Um, so the tech, you know, the humans build the tech. And the tech is not sentient, it's not a god, it's not some being, it's not going to happen. I just don't even want to go there. So um, the, the talk about, you know, the ascribing agency to a tool is a mistake. And that is a diversion tactic. And if you see who talks like that, it's literally the same people who have billions, poured billions of dollars into these companies. Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, John Talon, all the crypto billionaires, like that is, if you look at all of the institutes that are talking like that, it's the people funded by these um, really um, wealthy people who also poured money into creating DeepMind and OpenAI in the same, you know, companies that they say need to be stopped right now. So I just, you know, I think I was listening to the prior um, panel where uh, they were talking about how you have to go start from the people who are most marginalized, right? If you're listening, if you want to hear about existential risk, don't listen to the billionaires. They're not the ones who really are caring all about humanity. And so, uh, yeah, let's think about them instead, instead of the existential risk of the tech they're talking about. I mean, what you say actually reminds me of, of um, that New York Times piece profiling Jeffrey Hinton the godfather of AI and, and how he, he, he's warning everyone about the dangers. And, and there was quite a bit of a commentary over that because people like you said the same thing much earlier and you don't get a New York Times profile. he was nowhere to be found. He was nowhere, a few months ago, just a few months ago, Jeff Hinton was talking about GPT-4 and how it's the world's butterfly. Oh, it's like a caterpillar that takes data and then flies into a beautiful butterfly, you know. And now all of a sudden it's an existential risk. I, I mean, why are people taking these people seriously? I, I have theories about that. But yeah, Meredith Whitaker was, taught, was pushed out for talking about um, a Project Maven, a military contract. Right. Uh, I was pushed. I was fired for talking about large language models, but uh, not just that, but other issues of racism and sexism. My co-lead, Meg Mitchell, was fired after me. Um, Mahdi, a, a Moroccan a teammate of ours, also was pushed out after writing about large language, uh, resigned after writing about large language models. And before he was trying to get Google to get to do something about Truth TV in Morocco, which is one of, it's the most popular YouTube station. Um, and they were using it to harass all, all sorts of people. They didn't do anything about that, right? So all of us, people who are not white men, have been, you know, ringing the alarm. And none of them, uh, none of them supported us, right? Even Joshua Benjo, whose brother was my manager at Google, uh, did not, did not say anything when I was fired. And his brother quit after I was fired. So, you know, why Why all of a sudden everybody's paying attention to them, I have no idea. And look, I, I can't help but think of a, a very early warning about the dangers of technology and, and how uh, the things you create can turn into monsters, which is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, a 19-year-old woman, right, from the 19th century. Uh, but her book, uh, if, if only these these men in red 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 Frankenstein they might not be so shocked uh, talking about butterflies a few months ago and suddenly seeing the light now. 
Um, okay, so another question. Uh, do you have policy recommendations regarding the damages caused by the use of AI specifically for deep fakes? Um, I, you know, I think that I, I don't know uh, about policy recommendations specifically for deep fakes. You know, I'm not a policy person. I try to do research that informs policymakers. Mm -hmm. But um, AI now wrote a, um, a policy brief on general purpose AI systems that we uh, helped, uh, you know, we collaborated on and sent to the EU. And uh, we were very worried about um, this exemption that they were thinking about having for companies like OpenAI or others that put out quote unquote general purpose um, systems. So I think, um, and, and many of those are used to do deep fakes and, and other, other kinds of things, right? So I think that it's really important to hold, to hold them accountable and not uh, make it such that they're not accountable and they can kind of uh, kick the, out of, what is it called, the accountability down the road for the uh, organizations, smaller organizations that use their systems without them being held accountable. So um, yeah, that's what I think. And I think things like watermarking um, might be really important, but I really think we have to go to the source and hold um, the organizations that stand to make the most amount of money um, uh, accountable, held accountable. Well, certainly hope so. Uh one more question. What's your view on the anthropomorphization? I wish I, I can let me practice again. Anthropomorphization yeah. of AI yes, and hallucinations word. in chat form. Yes. <laughs> I, I have such trouble saying those words too. I think I think the anthropomorphization um, <laughs> um, is exactly what I was saying earlier. It's very harmful. Mm. It's very harmful because it does a number of things. It makes it it deceives people into thinking that there is something a lot more human like than there is right um if you know about the millions of workers kind of going sitting through and labeling data and then the huge compute power and then you see how the things come out after that you don't anthropomorphize these models because you kind of see there are lots of humans involved in this. It's not like a, a machine god or whatever talking or, or some sort of human talking back at you. But when you do this anthropomorphization, you do a number of things. One, you deceive people into seeing a human behind the text. And that's very harmful, right? Like, because you have, you can have all sorts of human text. Like there was this person who committed suicide, right? Just a few months ago after interacting with the chatbot. Right. You have to learn to know that this is made up text and not to trust it rather than being deceived into thinking there is a human behind or human-like thing behind the machine. And the second thing it does, again, which is very powerful, is to abdicate um, responsibility from the entities that make and deploy these systems to the systems themselves. So our entire conversation becomes about an actual tool rather than looking back at the incentive structure of who builds and deploys these tools. Timna, it's been really wonderful to talk to you. Do you have any final thoughts, comments, things you meant and wanted to say, but it didn't come up in questions? <laughs> you know, um, I think, you know, I just feel, uh, I, I, I feel sad I couldn't join in person. I'm really sad about the visa situations. I really, you know, I've had personal experiences with visas um, from when I was just my entire life. And um, I really believe it's a global apartheid system that's normalized. And I, I think, that it shouldn't be. Um, and so I just, yeah, that's, I think um, that's my final word, you know, uh, these, these borders are a global apartheid system that's, that are weaponized against many people, mostly, especially uh, black people around the world, but people of, of many other groups um, who are, um, whose movement is deterred. And, and you know, it's, I think it's, it's really this global apartheid system that um, we need to, um, fight against. Timnit Gebru, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thanks for joining us, whether you're remote or in the audience. Uh, we shall see you later. Uh, there'll, there's plenty more in the afternoon happening, and in the meantime, stay engaged. Thanks for watching.